Revolutionary Talk for Revolutionary Times. Promoting peace, liberty, and prosperity around the clock. LibertyTalk.fm. Welcome to Living in the Solution with Dr. Elena George. Today we have an important show, and I think, again, a timely one. We're living in economic times that are pretty challenging. And as a small business owner myself, this has been a three-year his- uh, period, I guess, where you've really had to stay on your toes and try to navigate unknowns and try to be nimble. And, you know, I was listening to a radio show this morning, and there was a statement made that I absolutely agree with. This pre-COVID, COVID, and post-COVID uh system that we're living in now has been a transfer of wealth. And I think it's been from the middle and working class to something else. I'm not sure where it's going, but it's not staying with us. And one of the things that we're learning recently is that the U.S. workforce is really being hit by inflation and small business owners are being hit and it's changing dynamics. And I wanted to have someone come on to talk about that because it's not being talked about in the media, but it's it affects every single person in society, especially workers and small business owners. So I wanted to invite an author, actually. Um, his name is Jose Nino, and he has a wealth of knowledge about this. He writes for multiple platforms, such as the Washington Times, the Mises Institute, Big League Politics, Liberty Conservative News, and Gunpowder Magazine. And as a freelance writer, I think, I'm sure he's, he writes about things that is cutting edge and things that people need to know about. So, Mr. Nino, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. I'm looking forward to our conversation. A pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, as a freelance writer, you get to write about whatever strikes you, I'm sure. What started you down the path of the economic system and how business owners and workers are being affected? Well, I've always been pretty... Skeptical of government intervention and especially easy money policies from the Federal Reserve for a while since I got into politics about 15 years ago. I mostly was inspired by people like Pat Buchanan and Ron Paul, and that's how I've become like much more skeptical of like big business and big government and a lot of like technocratic policies that, in my opinion, are designed specifically to destroy small and medium-sized businesses and consolidate power, not only among massive corporations, but also this massive administrative state that's growing day by day in DC that more colloquially would be known as a deep state, this unelected type of like state here that gives a ton of jobs to some of those parasitic people imaginable and it sucks out all like the productive capacities of the nation and it creates like a whole new class of people that just live off of like the taxpayer time and bring like zero value to society. I think that's really well said. And you know, one of the arguments when we were when I was a kid growing up, it was, you know, you work hard, you you fight through whatever adversity is and you can succeed. And that to me was what capitalism was, but it's changed, hasn't it? It's morphed. It's now crony capitalism, which is not the same. Do you see it that way? Yes, there's a there's a different. We have like a different kind of capitalist system in the U.S. now. That's a form of like managerial, like crony capitalism that ostensibly protects property rights and nominally allows for some degree of trade and, and all that but in the background there's a massive administrative state that's regulating a lot of businesses out of existence and when the smoke clears after all that regulation is implemented the small and medium-sized businesses get priced out because of just the the cost of complying with that myriad of regulatory red tape is too expensive and it'll put those businesses um, out of business, whereas the bigger enterprises, they can shoulder those costs. Like for them, like regulatory compliance is um, like a pittance in terms of like the t- type of costs they normally have to deal with on a daily basis. And most of the time, too, you see some big businesses who 
actually try to capture these regulatory bodies so they can craft policies that price out their competitors as well. There is definitely not just like a so-called appeal to the public good for having these regulations. A lot of this is also very cynical in nature. And in my opinion, the current system that we have is designed to benefit a lot of upper middle class actors and above and like really, really um, corrupt um, oligarchical types. I don't have any problem with rich people per se. If they make their money legitimately without like the state by actually providing a good or service that society values and whatnot, they, in my opinion, deserve to keep their wealth. But the, this new class of very parasitic economic actors are a major threat, in my opinion, to not just like like the middle class, but also like the functioning of the republic. Because when you have people who use the political process to enrich themselves and the state, like that, this creates a, this completely subverts the current system we have, and it just and it'll make like the U.S. just turn into another authoritarian banana republic, as opposed to like a unique nation that was actually based on the rule of law, limited government, and federalism. Well, you know, when you go down that path and you think about the bigger picture, what you just described to me is it's like a, a system within itself designed specifically to ace out any competition. And I want to just, I know we're going to talk about workers in a minute, but my my thought was, is it is it the small business owners, the medium business owners that employ a majority of the workers in this country or is it the big corporations? They make it sound like they're the only game in town. But honestly, who pro who provides more of the workforce, the small business medium or the corporate industry? Yeah, if you look at like a lot of figures, it's mostly the small uh, businesses and medium-sized businesses that are the ones that are the primary engines of of economic activity in the U.S. And they also have a really good social function too, because they allow for a lot of young people and free level workers and people that may not have skills and have questionable socioeconomic backgrounds to be able to gain the valuable experience and be kept off the streets, kept off from like do um from getting into trouble mm -hmm. basically. But whenever you have these mega corporations that when they become the only game in town, eventually you'll they they won't be able to hire all those people. And a lot of these people will then just have this, uh, be part of like a really precarious economic class that's like drifting from job to job or, or it's just like unemployed. And those type of people, as they say, like idle hands do the devil's work will be tantalized into like adopting very deviant lifestyles and just causing trouble. And that's why I, it's very important to highlight that like small businesses and medium-sized businesses do actually make big contributions in the American economy. They're not just these like this type of businesses that you just pass through and not and they're not like they're not like these type of businesses as well that that just offer like really small contributions. They actually do play a role in keeping communities vitalized and keeping a lot of people out of trouble. And they ultimately are 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 great stepping stones for people who want to have like successful careers in whatever field they want to get into. I think what you're describing is that they're the glue really of society, you know, yes. as there's nothing, you can't remove that foundation and expect a society to actually function. So on that note, let's take our first break and come back. You're living in the solution. Welcome back to Living in Solution. We're speaking with Mr. Jose Nino. And before the break, you were making an eloquent synopsis of where we find ourselves in this country. There's a lot of media hype about how important the corporate in industry is, whether that's car industry, whatever. You have to like follow the money, don't you? I mean, if you're looking at who's the in the commercial breaks, who's running or who's underpinning these media outlets, they have a reason to not highlight anything but the big box industry, whether that's Amazon or whatever corporate interest it is, because they're getting their money from them, aren't they? Yeah, th there's definitely an incentive for the corporate media and political actors to always obsess over big business 
because they're the ones that ultimately bankroll a lot of their campaigns or media enterprises. And it, just, it, it makes sense because it's um, big business is a huge constituency for a, a lot of these politicians and um, they answer to them. So they have to return the favor by always promoting their stuff and making the case that these are like incredibly important enterprises to have to like sometimes be bailed out altogether. Mm hmm. And we saw that, right, with the big banks back in, what, 2008 or whenever it was. It was just the template, it seems like, for what is coming down the pipe. Yes. And COVID, did that grease the wheels for this? Because when some entity got to decide what businesses were essential and what weren't, it was really eye-opening. As I mentioned in the past show in Georgia, strip clubs were considered to be essential, liquor stores but bakers and hairdressers and it was like totally arbitrary, almost what they decided was essential. Uh, yes, there, there is absolutely um, very much um, an arbitrary nature to what is like determined as essential. And it's also, it's also political too, because a lot of these type of businesses, um, if you actually are, were to peel back the onion, you probably find that a lot of these businesses are contributors to a lot of like establishment politicians on both sides of the aisle. And that's why they get, they get that type of protection um, in return for like campaign donations. It's a lot of back scratching in the political process. I come from a lobbying background, uh, specifically second amendment. And you see this kind of uh, politics happen behind closed doors. So there, what you saw during COVID was a massive transfer of wealth from like the, lower middle class to middle class to all the way to the upper classes because this was like in my opinion the biggest consolidation of corporate power i've seen in my lifetime with all these small businesses that have been like irreversibly shuttered due to a lot of lockdowns the social distancing and other arbitrary covid regulations though i will say this that in many respects covid presented a very good opportunity for these politicians to punish their political enemies and reward their friends because most politics boils down to the friend enemy distinction and politicians um all things being equal love to reward their friends and relish at the idea of punishing their enemies it's it's like the base part of human nature what you're describing it's just got highlighted and empowered and you know, that it seems to me there was some distraction going on as well, don't you think, with the sustainable income and this, uh, equ you know, equality and diversity. <laughs> I mean, the equality really didn't come. It, it's not what people thought. It wasn't raising the standard of everybody. It was actually lowering the standard. Is that one way to see it? Yeah, the equality um, movement is really about... Um, creating like divide and conquer type of scenarios where you generate racial or tension or tension among the sexes as well, because there's also a big war um, that these <clears throat> central planners are trying to wage between the two genders. They try to foment that. And it's a good way to reward constituencies um, and grievance groups and create a whole plethora of like sinecures and politically assigned jobs to people. Like when you have, all these like black studies, uh, feminine, uh, radical feminist type of work that is like a total jobs fair for a lot of unproductive people in like the non-governmental non organization sector. And this kind of stuff is done um, to just um, siphon resources away from productive people and giving them to unproductive people. And it, it's a total grift and um, Scam, but that's how a lot of this entire political process goes in a, in an epoch where uh, big government and cronyism reigns supreme. I think that's well said. And it, you know, while you're busy hating on each other, they're they're taking the money from everybody. Where these little fiefdoms yes. that you just described get paid from whatever largesse, some billionaire, some foundation, but it's actually a separate pot of money. You know, for me, it seems to me that they're very short-sighted because when their usefulness is gone, they're going to be out on the street 
and they're not going to have money coming in. And you're right. Um, I I wonder what what contribution they I mean tangible contribution they make to society. Uh, it's we have to start thinking about a bigger picture, don't we? Instead of just me, 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 or I'm a you know professional victim. That's got to stop because it actually helps this process move along, doesn't it? Yes, the, those people are pawns. They ultimately aren't the ones that are driving the policy change. And once they've outlived their usefulness, they will be discarded. And like that's the thing, um, divide. That's the that's the rub about divide and rule is that the people that are fighting amongst each other, I, they're just exhausting each other while like the elites are just rubbing their hands together, knowing that nobody's going to focus on the stuff that they're that they're pulling off behind the scenes and they just continue to enrich themselves. It's one of the many ways that the parasitic elites that lord over us are able to perpetuate the political scam that they've imposed nationwide. From the standpoint of sustainable income, this just makes me think, when you start talking about it's or whether we're living in a point where it's you get more money for not working than you do by going to work. Again, it's like this a pacifier. You're getting money for doing nothing. You're getting, and it's not even sustainable, right? A thousand dollars a month. I'm not sure who could live on that, honestly. But is that one of the reasons that people are not complaining? I mean, this is a major deal. Losing your job or going to work and getting paid less than being than staying home. That is counterproductive, isn't it? I mean, counterintuitive to me, but is that just another way to pacify people so they can, it's like a, you know, frog boiling in water. It's very slow until you figure out that you're in trouble. Yes, I believe that you're correct about the latter point that this is a pacification scheme. I've been arguing that like universal basic income is going to become a very mainstream talking point. And there's going to be like, there's already cities that are doing trial runs of it. And then you can eventually have states doing it because um, there's so much economic and like just like social unrest that's brewing that the political class is going to try to buy off voters to calm them like in the short term. They may pull it off for like the uh, medium term, but I think that a universal basic income, if it's like implemented fully, it's just going to exacerbate the fiscal problems we have and potentially create a much bigger inflationary problem too. So it's like a, it's um it's similar to the welfare state in the 20th century when it was implemented after like the industrial revolution and the economic dislocation it created. There was um the welfare state was a measure used by elites to pacify the population, especially at a time when the commun when communist movements were gaining a lot of steam. So in order to co-opt a lot of these radical movements, politicians erected the welfare state as a way to pacify people. And it kind of worked, but um, long-term it's been a disaster given how it's created welfare dependency. And it's arguably one of the primary factors of why you're seeing a destruction of the family unit, especially in the US when you promote so, so much government uh, dependency. So now I believe that there is going to be a another great leap forward with regards to this universal basic income or other similar uh, guaranteed income stream. You know, it sounds to me too, it's, I, I'm looking from a medical standpoint, if the government or some central organization controls your, your bread and butter, your money, then they can control your behavior too, right? I mean, I've seen it's come and it's come and gone. Little things like you have to not drink soda in order to get your your uh, your social you know your welfare funds. I mean, is it going to come down to smoking, taking vaccines? I mean, it just seems to me like it's a slippery slope where you have to toe the line. You have to follow the guidelines, or you're going to be frozen out in some way. Yes, I do believe that these so-called guaranteed income schemes will have um, what will be will be conditional. Where if you 
tweet the wrong things, say the wrong things, or publish content that goes against the regime's narrative, they're probably going to bar certain people from receiving them. Because that's where we're heading to now in the U.S., where they're, they are um, effectively criminalizing or ostracizing, for lack of a better term, any type of opinion that goes against the prevailing regime narrative. So, yes, I do believe that if these programs are rolled out, you will see some some exceptions where they will not give them to people that affect. And this is going to lead to like even broader forms of exclusionary policies, such as like people getting debanked, and which is happening already, mm-hmm. and deplatformed altogether. It's a form of behavioral control, and it's not always done by the state per se. To well, it seems like it's a grid, right? So it's not just the state because they're working with the corporations, which I think is a definition of fascism, actually. But we're talking now about not being able to take out a lot of money. You know, they have a, a set limit on your 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 withdrawals. You can't use your money in Kentucky now to buy, you know, any kind of weapon legally. So, I mean, there's like social uh, restrictions and they're kind of subtle, but they're, people need to be paying attention to them because that's the beginning. If they can get away with this with nobody knowing, what it, what else can they get away with? That's the question I think that people probably need to ask themselves. Yes, absolutely. And yeah, it is like subtle because a lot of um, the U.S. For, for its faults, it still has pretty strong constitutional protections for like the Second Amendment and the First Amendment. So a lot of these political elites, they have to outsource that type of anti-freedom activity to mega corporations and big tech Mm -hmm. but it's ultimately going it's part of the regime i consider these corporations and these politicians and bureaucrats to be part of like the same overarching regime that looks to dispossess us and destroy our freedoms i couldn't have said it better on that note let's take our second break because when we come back i want to go into the more detail about what's going on with the small businesses and Are they able to stay open? It seems like inflation has really put uh, a whammy on people. So let's take our second break. You're living in the solution. If you miss the show, you can catch it on DrLanaGeorge.com, iTunes, Spotify, and a host of multimedia platforms. You can follow her on Living in the Solution on Telegram and Living in the Solution on Facebook. Subscribe and share it with your friends. You're listening to Dr. Elena George, Advocate for Living in the Solution. Welcome back to Living in the Solution. We're speaking with Mr. Jose Nino. He's a freelance writer who writes for multiple platforms, and he has a wealth of knowledge about how our system really works, not what they say, not what they're trying to make us believe in by gaslighting us, but actually what's going on. I mean, I think... This is not a dual party system to me. It's a it's a uniparty. And there are people who, you know, these fake opposition, they're all friends, glad slapping each other, you know, having a great time at our expense. And while they, they're very good at divide and conquer, I think you're absolutely right. And it seems to me that we've lost our center, like what makes us all the same as Americans, as humans for that matter. And it's been what divides us, what you look like, where you live, your accent. It's just stupid things. Why? I know you might not be answered this question, but why are they being so successful at this? Is it because we just don't pay attention or do they really have a beat on our lowest common denominator? It's largely successful, mostly due to the fact that there is an absence of leadership in a lot of key positions, especially at the federal level, where it's a unity party, as you mentioned. And there isn't really meaningful opposition, would say for like a few reps in like the so-called like America First faction of the Republican Party, but that's like maybe like 10 to 13 people, like at most. And what's happening is though, more and more people are starting to realize that the system is a scam thanks to like alternative media and a lot of content creators that are now exposing the outright falsehoods and untruths that the corporate press and their 
their allies like in the political class are spreading. So more and more people are beginning to challenge those narratives and they're forming their own organizations, shows, and even getting people elected at the local and state level. I don't really believe that necessarily like the people are dumb. It's just that now we have the tools, better tools at our disposal and we're getting better at using them to build up token resistance. I mean, back then, uh, in the pre-internet age, I was of the view, and still am of the view, that <clears throat> the ruling class could get away with a lot more stuff because it, it, they had like much tighter control on the information. But now there is a a much more level playing field. And as a result, that's why you see so much deplatforming um, on big tech and other institutions as well, because they know that in a free internet, the ruling class cannot win in a, in a, under, in a, under the context against the backdrop of like a free internet. So they're, they're gonna do everything possible to shut down, but it's really hard because it's a, it's a game of whack-a-mole they can't really win because whenever they take down, say like one content creator or a few content creators, there's more that'll just pop up because the information is already out there. It's a matter of the people acting on it and building like shows, institutions, and organizations that can push back against these media, political, and economic forces. Is there one of the ways that we can push back is to take our power of our purse back, right? So if we really spend our money locally, right? Small businesses, mm -hmm. that would really, I mean, the, the big box stores are not the only game in town, honestly. People need to figure that out. And if they did, let's say a, a, a percentage, not even 100%, would that put some pressure on this monolith to, I don't know, pay attention to us, to, to not be as a, uh, as uh, successful as they've been? Yes. In my opinion, it is a absolute disservice to continue to shop at big box locations whenever you have small, small and medium-sized business alternatives in your community. Not every community has that, so it's gonna vary from person to person and region to region. But when there's like plenty of small business options where you live in, mm -hmm. In my opinion, that's one of the easiest things you could do to give the proverbial middle finger to the system because that's the power of the purse, as you mentioned. And as consumers, we can exercise our consumer sovereignty by voting with our dollars and making sure that institutions that hate us don't receive a cent from us. Makes sense to me. And imagine all the, you know, the, I wouldn't say the minority neighborhoods, but just just diversity throughout the country. If you were to shop your own neighborhood with your people who you know, your neighbor, then again, it would raise the bar for everybody. We wouldn't be needing the state to help us if we did it. You know, there's so much money floating around. We just seem to want to give it away to people, as you said before, work against us, can't stand us, want us out of the picture. But there's more of us than are them. And I think when people, if they can make that leap to, Hey, you know, what What makes us the same? What interests do we share? Because we actually all want the same thing. Live well, take our vacations, raise our kids without being, you know, somehow thwarted and live to a nice long age healthily, right? So if we can all figure that out, then if we could see where this is taking that choice away from us, maybe that would be the, the beginning of us standing back and saying, we, we're done with playing your game. Do you think that would be a, another mindset that people could adopt that would make them less susceptible? Yes. Yeah, people will need to, um, they have to think locally ultimately when it comes to how they spend their money and even when they do their politics. There is an obsession with federal politics and it's important because a lot of this stuff affects, like federal politics affects everybody like all the way down to the local level. You can't really escape it, but the same time people can do their part not everybody is going to be like the mr smith that goes to washington that will change things some people are just going to have to like really hit the pavement at their local city council 
or county commission and make noise there and put politicians on blast whenever they um, act out of line and basically relieve them of the burden of holding higher office um, when push comes to shove. And there's a lot of ways people can get involved. They can also build their own business. We do need more business owners ultimately that provide goods and services for the community because the more small businesses and medium-sized businesses that go under, the more consolidated the system becomes. And we have to make sure that this system does not become more consolidated. I agree. And the article that you wrote recently, it's, called, it's entitled Record Numbers of Small Businesses uh, Went Delinquent on Their Rents in October. That's a really real-time, up-to-date vision of what's going on on the ground. And you wrote it for Big League Politics. I'll have a link at the end, uh, you know, at the end of the show and people can go and read it themselves. But it sounds dire, all right? So if you compare this to the height of COVID when people were shut down and they started opening up back again, is this number of small businesses struggling, is this comparable or is this worse than what it was? Oh, it's, it's, it's worse. And these numbers are probably, um, I think, to be honest, may worsen next year, especially <clears throat> with inflation prospects not going away anytime soon. And there's no real indicator that the Fed and the political class will exercise both either fiscal or, or monetary restraint. And a lot of the measures that the, the Fed's pursuing are at best like half measures that won't contain this kind of stuff. So I think it's going to get worse next year. And this is only the tip of the iceberg. So for those who are not really sure what inflation is, I mean, we have these cycles, right? We've gone, we've had it in 2008. It's like it happens every few years. Is there something that triggers this? Is this, I know there was a lot of money out there with basic zero interest rates, negative, whatever they were doing. And then people were taking a lot of loans and that was free money out there. When they contract that, is that what's what's happening? Is that there's less money out there? And so the I'm not sure exactly how to put it, but what drives it basically is what I'm asking. Okay, inflation is essentially the expansion of the monetary supply when I like a government or like a central bank um prints more money that um that goes into circulation in the economy. And when that money becomes like circulated, like in like large degree, when there's like a lot of exchange of that money among economic actors after it's printed, that's when you start seeing the subsequent price rises and then like the total destruction of people's savings. Because one thing about inflation is that inflation benefits the debtors. Like if you have like consumer debt, mortgages or whatever, it actually benefits you. But for like people that like the everyday person that has savings, um, you, you get that stuff like eviscerated, like in your bank account and all that. Your dollars just lose more value, like not just like on a day by day basis or a week basis, but sometimes even like hourly basis, depending on how bad the inflation is. And it's absolutely destructive. The people that benefit really are those that are closest to the freshly printed money, like the banksters, the politicians, the bureaucrats, and politically connected businesses too. So, in some, Inflation is a monetary phenomenon. It's not like the way some people say that it's a failure of capitalism or whatever. It's actually the opposite of capitalism because under a capitalist system, you would have like a mo more competing currencies and a sounder money that's tighter in nature, where there's not where there's going to be um, a more contractionary type of uh, monetary policy to some extent, but it's ultimately going to be undergirded by competing currencies as opposed to like a centrally established monetary system. And I know that we're going to take a break in a minute, but I wanted to open the conversation about this digital and uh, these non-paper uh, instruments. You know, I'm just curious, Are I know the dollar is not backed by gold, so it's kind of just fiat. What's the difference between that and these digital currencies? Are they backed by anything? Because I know that between crypto dying and all these other things, I know the Fed is trying to come up with their own. Is that going to be backed by something? Does that make, is this a value thing that people should consider? Or is this just an upgrade of fiat cur currency? 
Um, well, this, in my opinion, is like a kind of an upgrade of fiat currencies. And they are trying to co-op a lot of the cryptocurrency space, which I do believe has some promise. Certain um, cryptocurrencies are promising, but they are trying to co-op the energy from that and use it for a more centralized technocratic project that will allow for the powers that be to have access to people's transactions and be able to exert more control over them. Okay. Well, that goes back to our initial conversation, but let's take our last break because I think that that connection really does need to be tied so that we can, that listeners can really understand the power of what you just said. So let's take our last break. You're living in the solution. Welcome back to Living Solution. Again, we're speaking with Mr. Jose Nino, and you can read his articles. He has one on big league politics, the one that I just described. And you write for a number of uh, different platforms. Is what's the most, is you have your own website that people can go to, or how can we, they literally go back and read things that you've written? Um, they can check out my work at Big League Politics. Also, I am pretty prolific on my Substack, Jose Nino Unfiltered, JOSBCF.substack.com. Thank you. So before the break, we were talking about the the fact that the banks can have much more information about you what you do. I can imagine this is tied social to the your social media, what you say, your behavior. I mean, the, the thing in Kentucky is, strikes me is very mercenary where they're not allowing people to use their own money for purchases that they don't agree with. Is the central bank system, if it goes digital, will that be on steroids? Will that be even more aggressive in terms of control? Yes. Those type, if, if you have like a fully digital currency, digitized currency, it will give technocrats a ton of information about people and their spending habits that they can use against them to control them, to blackmail them, and just make their lives more miserable. And that's the thing about cash. Like, say what you want about cash. It is, like, used for, like, illicit purposes, but it's also a double-edged sword where it's actually useful for people that want to maintain a anonymous streak to the to their otherwise private spending habits that are usually lawful, that are overwhelmingly lawful, just mm-hmm. because criminals use like cash doesn't mean that the use of cash should be um, illegitimized, but there's some people that believe that. And the war on cash really is like a war on privacy because once you get rid of that, you're, you're one step closer to like a digital currency system that the technocrats will absolutely take advantage of to socially engineer and modify people's behaviors. And maybe even criminalize them if it goes down a pipe that it seems to want to go down. I mean, this is not about people yeah. having any freedom to say what they want. They're the worst people in the world. They need to be muzzled. They need to be removed from society. That's the rhetoric that goes along with it. It's nothing about live and let live with that kind of system. And having saying it and taking someone off of social media, right, is completely different than turning off their money so they can eat or pay their rent or travel. I mean, that's the whole different level. And I think it's uh, desensitizing people by this cloud of hatred. Because I disagree with you, you need to be just erased. That mindset is allowed to really just ooze through society with no backlash. It doesn't seem that way to you that if you're, if you're on the right side of the argument, everything else, you get a pass, no matter how nasty, no matter how vindictive, no matter how evil your behavior is, it just gets a pass. That's got to stop too, don't you think? Yeah, th- th- there's nothing feel good about these measures. They'll say like, this is like for the children or for the good of society, and really it's a blatant power grab to like shut down anybody that disagrees with them. These people are very unhinged and they are showing their colors. Now they're true colors because for the first time, the ruling class is being threatened in a genuine manner due to the rise of alternative media and a lot of 
outlets that are starting to gain traction in, un, in an unprecedented manner. And that has compelled these people in the ruling class to pursue some very clumsy uh, <clears throat> yet authoritarian measures against their opponents. And there's going to come a point where they overplay their hand, hand because there can only be um, people will only take so much um, in terms of like tyrannical action and eventually someone, something's got to give. And that's why I'm pretty optimistic about the future because there are more people who are waking up to this, um, to this kind of stuff. And they're starting to realize that the system that's in front of them is for all intents and purposes, illegitimate and a scam. And they're putting two and two together and some of them are becoming very productive and mounting effective resistance against it. You, you mentioned one method is to open your own business and to, you know, shop at your local mom and pop shops. What else can people do? I mean, there's if you're a worker and you don't want to open or you can't open a uh, your own location, what power does a worker have to withdraw their consent from the system? They can still be able to read up on this information and get educated on this. Like um, education is an ongoing process from a from a worker all the way to like the CEO of a company. Like you, um, you will always um, benefit from educating yourself. Education does not um, does not stop at the classroom. It's, it's an ongoing process. At the same time, even like people that can't open up like small businesses, they can still be they can still participate in local politics. They can go to their city council, uh, raise awareness on issues, um, organize campaigns and all of that, and build organizations to uh, and band together. Really what I stress is that people need to find like-minded people that share their values and beliefs to build tribes and organizations because the ruling class thrives off, um, off the fact that off of atomization and when we're all like divided and isolated, when we're able to band together, and share our experiences and build things together. That's when we are at our best and most potent against the these parasitic actors. I would agree with that. And, you know, I just want to emphasize what you just said. It's across all demographics. It's not what you look like. It's not what school you went to. It's a mindset. And that, to me, supersedes everything. We need to start thinking about that. We're human. That should be the thing that that unites us, not anything else. Because if we try this divide and conquer strategy where I'm better than you, I'm more special, I'm more of a victim, you owe me, you're just playing into their hands, aren't you? Yeah. Um, people can I like the right to like really associate with who they want based on like religion, race, creed, or whatever, but they shouldn't be forming like organizations that pursue like anti antagonistic goals um against other groups or really advance like the regime's like agenda like you you don't want to be forming those type of organizations those type of organizations should be avoided and ridiculed really because um they're just useful idiots at best for the regime you know it also strikes me that when you do that then it it actually it denigrates the person you know, if because I look a certain way, I can never get ahead. I've, I'll be a prof professional victim and basically a drain on society because you feel like you can't do it, so why bother? And I'm going to take it because I deserve it. I mean, that's not conducive to a society. That's not conducive to a society that's going to be cohesive and forward-thinking and successful. I mean, they basically want everybody at each other's throat from what we just talked about so that they can suck resources, suck labor, and basically live on the backs of everybody else. I think if we can, pe people can figure that out, I think turning off the TV, turning off the mainstream, corporatized media, healthcare system, you name it, anything that's corporate, you need to take a really long, hard look at it, would you say? Yes, people definitely should be questioning um, anything that's like mainstream now, because if it's mainstream, it's very likely going to be approved by some of the worst actors possible, in my opinion. But 
yeah, people do need to exercise caution about the information they consume and the people they follow because oftentimes a lot of it is junk and you have to exercise a, a, a healthy degree of skepticism towards people and institutions that are advancing content that aligns with the acceptable opinions that the regime puts forward. I think from going through the last COVID going through COVID, being in it, whatever, it's pretty obvious now to me, and I hope people are figuring this out. This system is going in the wrong direction. It's been wrong about everything that they've pronounced, everything that they've asked us to do, you know, flattening the curve, staying home. None of that stuff has worked. I hope that if there, another iteration comes around, that people will be a lot more critical in their thinking and more aggressive about protecting themselves and their interests. And, you know, if you don't have a purpose, someone's trying to take away your purpose, you don't matter is what they're basically saying. I would be up in arms about that. No, we, we don't have, we have about a minute left. I want to make sure people know how to reach your, get your Substack, read your articles and follow you. Yes. Um, follow me at Twitter at Jose Almino. And my Substack, as I mentioned before, is Jose Nino Unfiltered at josbcf.substack.com. And that is, and Big League Politics is where I publish most of my written content. And you can find me there as well. And I want to thank you so much for joining me today because the conversation, I don't think it's easy to listen to because everybody wants to believe that, that our government cares about us and that they have the best in you know you know, in their hearts for everybody to thrive. But I don't think that's the case. And as long as we want somebody to take care of us, I think we're going to be in harm's way, don't you? Yeah, people need to make sure to not only educate themselves, but try to find other like-minded people so they can band together because we, we are um, entering a pretty existential conflict here and we need to be ready for whatever um, the powers that be throw at us. I think that's a great place to end it because that's a call to action. Now, I want to thank you so much, much, Mr. Nino. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. I had, a, I had a great time. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for living in the solution. Revolutionary Talk for Revolutionary Times. Liberty Talk FM.